Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you. Thank you for your hospitality. It's been a, a great visit for me. How many of you have heard of Equifax before you came here? Raise your hands. One, two, three. How many of you have heard of a credit bureau? Okay. So let me do this. The next 30, 40 minutes or one hour, I'll talk about what is big data? How is big data being used in companies? What is Equifax? How do we use big data in Equifax? And finally, what's it for you, for your careers? How do you mold your careers so that you can be ready to start using big data? Does that make sense? OK? Good, thank you. Before I start talking about, you know, Equifax, what we, what we do at Equifax, let me, as I said, let me talk to you about what is big data. You have been given, I'm sure, a lot of definitions of what a big data is. You know, people talk about unstructured data, this data, that data, small data. So I will sort of give you an example of how a big data is being used for hundreds of different purposes. Before I go in, okay, I want to introduce a concept. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. I use the word information asymmetry. This is the only time I'm going to talk about this information asymmetry, but I think this is very important for everyone to understand this. What I mean by this is that I as a company, I or someone else in a company would like to know about you, but there's always a gap, how much I want to know and how much is available. You know, closing that gap is where big data comes in. For instance, if I know what you need in terms of products, services, and the big data can help me close that gap, I can provide you the right products and services. That is where you have this whole concept of big data. People say, oh, big data, big data. So we're trying to close that information asymmetry gap. That's what we do all the time. Can I close the gap? Can I know more about you than I've known before so that I can give you the right product and service? Make sense? Okay. This clicker is giving me a little problem, so. Okay. Is anyone by name Gabriel Dares here? No? Okay, good. I just took, this is like the John Smith in the US. I said, let me take a name. Okay, and I said, let me take Gabriel Dares. And I said, do we know him? Do you know him? The answer now is, I don't know, okay? But hopefully in the next 15 minutes, you will know him. That is what I'm talking about big data. We can go back and say big data is, you know, so many Twitter feeds, so many Facebook posts and all that. But I want to go back slightly different and say, what is big data as, as what David there is going to do, okay? So let me give an example. So, where, where is the, uh, over there? Yes. Okay, thank you. Over there. Okay, we'll go. See if, you know, I need instructions. Even though I have a lot of computers, I still need instructions. To that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is that, I'm going to walk you through a Gable Dazzers one day. What does he do on a regular day and what we can learn out of him, okay? So he gets up in the morning. He gets up in the morning, what does he do? He watches TV, okay? And you know, he watches TV and there's a cable box. I know what TV show he's watching, okay? Then I go back to the next one. What, is, what does he do? After watching TV, he goes, opens his uh, iPhone, puts some post, 
and figures out emails, text, and all that. Regular day in the morning. I'm sure everyone here does it. Don't you guys do that? Right? Then what happens? He goes to coffee, a coffee shop. What does he do there? He drinks coffee. At the same time, I know he went to coffee because there's location data. So he's going to a location, so I know exactly which coffee shop he went to. As you look through the day, you can see what we call the data exhaust. How much data is being exhausted as he goes from one place to another and what data is being collected, okay? Then what happens is, and how many of you are, are familiar with telematics? Anyone? One, okay. You know what happens is that in, in, in many insurance companies, they give you a device, a device that you put that in your car. And what happens when you do that, it gives you the insurance companies all the information they need. And, and that would help you even get a better rate. For instance, what's happening now is that you cluster people together and say the insurance rate is $100 per month or something like that. But when you start getting the details of your driving behavior, we, you know, the insurance companies can even structure the rates much better. Okay. So in the morning, as he goes from, wakes up in the morning, he enters the office, you can see the amount of data that's being generated. Location, speed, what kind of, you know, shows he's watching. It goes on and on. Then you go to the next day, in the afternoon. What happens in the afternoon? I'll get the thing out okay. He goes to office, he checks his email, looks at all the stuff. What happens again? Digital crumbs is left. Everywhere he does, whatever he does, you start giving and leaving a trail of digital crumbs. It's almost like bread crumbs. He leaves it. And then he goes to lunch outside. What happens in lunch outside? He goes, buy something, and at the same time, he decides to go to some local electronic store to buy stuff. And he kind of, maybe some cable, maybe some device. But what happens? He won't find it. Then he goes back to the office, logs on to Amazon, and orders that. So you can see the digital trail that's being left everywhere. Finally, you know, at the same time, he may log on to the bank, may do some bank transfers, something like that. So, you know, it goes on and on. And, and the, the point we're trying to make here is that it, it gets, the whole device is mediating our lives, okay? Then at the evening, once the office is done, he goes to the gym. He scans his car, he loves spinning, and it is there in the database. So everything what he does, then he goes to a grocery store, you can see that, he goes to a bar, restaurant, everything he does, there is a, a digital breadcrumbs. At the end, even when he goes to sleep, he has a thick bed and tells you exactly how long he sleeps. That's pretty scary, isn't it? But that's when you've got to be very careful, you know. When companies get all this data, it's a very fine line between being intimate with the customer and being creepy. <laughs> Don't you guys agree? I mean, that's, that's the beauty. You've got to be careful. With this kind of information, you have to be responsible of how you take this. That's the reason in my company, Equifax, governance is a big, big deal. We spend a lot of time money and effort to make sure that data is governed properly. But this is what's happening. It's happening in the sense that data is being generated. We don't have control. So, but we have to figure a way out how do we govern that data? How do we use that data? Okay? So, do I know him now? I pretty much know Gabriel, right? He lives, I know where he lives because of the vacation data. I know how long he commutes. 15 minutes or so. I know his network because he's on Facebook. He's got 200 friends. Gives me an idea. I know his income to a certain extent because he's gone to the bank, but I predicted. You know, his sentiment. So you have an idea 
who does it give the others? And just one day we've been able to collect so much information. Just imagine when we have information on him for months and years. At Equifax, we have information for years on, on behavior. So I can pretty much tell, you know, what the customer is in terms of the behavior. Any questions? Interrupt me. Go ahead. All this information is being gathered. So for instance, like when you go in, in an iPhone, they say, okay, would, would, you know, would you like your location to be tracked? You say yes. It goes somewhere else. So be careful what you want to say yes and no. So the information that you have, you think that you know, it's only in your iPhone, it is not. It's a better. Okay. So that's the reason I was talking about governance. How do you govern this data? How do you use this data? It's very important. So you can see what we're trying. And so when somebody, so when you start getting offers, and they pretty much know what you're doing, and you can see on your iPhone or an Android phone, you get start getting mobile offers because of these kind of information that you are you are sharing with them. Sometimes in this generation, in your generation, there's no problem. You know, kids have no issues sharing that information with with the company. In my generation, we are very quiet. You know, we're not that open. Okay, so that's you know that's the difference. So you will see all that. I think it's a reasonable way to say yes, isn't it? Do I know that person pretty well. So now what I can do is, what do I do with that? Okay. So this is a little bit of a. Why do I need to know Gabriel? I mean, I want to tell you why. I mean, if somebody says, why do you want to know me? There's two things. One is from the customer point of view, and the other one is from the business point of view. How many of you are marketing majors? No, but okay, financial majors? Okay, one. One of the mo most important, obviously there's all a lot of, for a company, the most important financial metric is as you know, revenue, income, you know, kind of balance sheet, and stuff like that. From my point of view, the two most important non-financial metrics is customer satisfaction and lifetime value of the customer. Okay? And I'll tell you why this is important for big data. If you're not satisfied, if you're not satisfied, what happens? You never come back to us. As a, as, as a business. Customer satisfaction leads to brand loyalty. A brand loyalty means that if you're satisfied with my company, you'll come back to me. Okay? If you're not, so we'll, we'll walk away from somewhere else. Brand loyalty will lead to frequency of purchases. That means the more loyal you are, the more you're going to buy from us. <laughs> See, I still have to learn computers. <laughs> Information management exam. PowerPoints, right? <laughs> One of the best things you gotta do is you have to learn PowerPoint skills. That's very important for your career. You know. Forget about big data. It's like a PowerPoint. How do you come create PowerPoint slides and use this? <laughs> now, anyway, so I just uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're not satisfied, if you're satisfied, your brand loyalty. If you're satisfied with Amazon, you go to Amazon. And you Amazon, you buy many times, and that's the reason what happens, your lifetime value goes up. That is the way every business has to think. But what happens is, What does brand loyalty mean in this time and age? In this time and age, brand loyalty means you will come to my company first. Because I know Equifax, I know Amazon, I know this company, they've been good to me, I'll come to you first. That's exactly what brand loyalty means. If you don't, 
give the right offer, the right suggestion to you. You just one click away to leave. Okay? So what happens is you come to my company, I don't know, to buy soap. You come to buy a car and I offer you a bicycle, you would say, are you easy, crazy? You walk away. That is what I mean. So what happens is that when you have a brand loyalty, come to us first, give us the right offer. If you don't, just one click away to somebody else. To reduce that, this is where you are talking about, you got to minimize the information asymmetry. I need to know more about you than anyone else so that I can give you the right offer. That's where we get a company. I need to know what is Gabriel is doing. You know, he is commuting every day to a certain place. The car that he needs is an electric car because there's charging stations around. So that's what I mean. So when people say, why big data? This is the big data. You know, we have to understand what the customer needs are. I can't wait for him to call me and say, hey, this is what I want. Any questions? Make sense? This is some of the examples. I said that I just gave you an example of a marketing company. I worked for like 20 years in marketing company. That's what we're trying to do. Give them the relevant offer, the right offer. But now we can see, based on Gabriel's information, what else can we can do, different companies can do. If there is, if I know it's commute, can I plan retail stores better? You know, I was talking about insurance earlier. So now I know his driving patterns. Can I give him a better rate? You know, he's a very safe driver. Why should I charge him a much higher premium? So that's where loyalty comes in. So if I know what he buys and consumes, the right offers. If I know his areas of interest, I can tailor my messages. I mean, that's the beauty of big data. It's that you, you almost know that person very well. And I keep coming back. Make sure it is customer intimacy, not customer creepiness. You know, you can't call up and say, I know your state is a single. I mean, that is you know, not something that you appreciate. But the, you know, that's what I mean. And you've got to understand and be really responsible of how we use this information to make sure you make the right offer and the and Gabriel becomes a legend customer of the company. Any questions? Some people had questions like, what's the difference between data, analytics, you know, data mining, things like that. Before I can go into what Equifax does, that's what I want to do this spend spend rest of the time. I can answer those questions. You, you had some questions on that. What was the question you had? My question specifically was trying to, to discover the, the border between big data and the moment that we are applying data analytics or something like that. Thanks. Uh, another, another question is related with the data mining versus big data or uh, when do you think that you have enough information, enough number of records in your database? So you have to 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 go. Uh, you have to leave the the relational database to go to one database so, uh, oriented to big data, something like that. Okay. If I summarize, you're asking how much information is sufficient to do data mining. That's one. Number two, what's data mining and big data, the differences? And number three is general aspect of analytics and statistics and all that. Is it okay? Okay, good. Before I answer that question, how many of you are statistics major? Okay. Computer science. A lot of computer science, okay. Economics. One economics, okay. Any, 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 any field of study in Avocado? Mathematics. Mathematics? Applied, oh, that's my love. You, you know, yeah. That's my, I love, I love mathematics. Yeah. Um, 
they, you know, people keep talking about big data, you know. At FFX, big data was big data even before it was called big data. Okay. You have heard of definition of big data based on the three Vs and four Vs. Have you familiar with that? Velocity, volume, and all that. Okay. You know, it, it, it's it's sort of a general way of saying that. But big data is basically because of every data that's being generated, data exhaust, like the location data, or now you can all store the data. The data is accessible. So it's, since the data is accessible, <laughs> I swear, I'm not touching it, I'm just kidding. <laughs> since the data is accessible, it is the, the, the volume, it, it's, it's accessible. That's what big data is. All the data, even the data that is structured data, it's all put together and say that's big data. Okay. But sometimes what happens, people also use the word unstructured data. Unstructured data is a is a very very what I call uh, promising area. Okay. And you know he asked about how much data is sufficient. The two kinds of data: structured data and, and, and unstructured data. Unstructured data, to a large extent, the information get get out of it is orthogonal to the structured data. I'm talking a little bit of mathematics and statistics here. When I say orthogonal, I mean you get all new information from unstructured data than the structured data. You still with me? No. I'll try again. Unstruck big data to a large extent is think of it as a lot of data that's being generated by machine, generated data by Facebook, generated data by Twitter, all this data is being generated. That that's the big data. Okay. One of the issues we had in in the old data was that it was not contextual. When it's in our contextual, we get that data, but we didn't know why the data was there. Okay. Now what happens is that because of all the unstructured data, we have a sense of con context of that data. So that's the unstructured data, that's the big data using with using the structured data. Okay. In terms of data mining, I'll talk to you about data mining. When I was in graduate school, the best way we could do data mining was you take a sample. And you build a model, regression, logistic, whatever you build a model, and then try to go and say, okay, what? How can you go apply it on the, you know, the whole universe? But now, what's happened now is all the data is available, the whole universe. So the beauty of it is just you don't have to take samples, but you can also take the entire universe with, and and you can look at long tail behavior. Does this make sense? Long tail behavior, okay? And that's where you start using a lot of machine learning, a lot of neural networks, things like that, so that you want to go look at long tail behavior. So many of the things when I was studying, we always know we all get hypothesis and then go, you, you know, you accept it or fail to reject, things like that. But now what's happening is you have the entire universe. We can do things like we've never done before. We can, as I said, fraud. Fraud is the biggest issue, as you know. And what happened is that, you know, fraud is not something like 1%, 2%. It's one in a million, but huge problems. So you can look at really tail, in the entire universe, look at the long tail. Make sense? So that's the beauty of this, the, in this infrastructure, in, in this environment, where we're able to really go after the entire universe, look at things we've never done before. So that's, so if you're in computer science, if you're in, in, in um, um, statistics, things like you have to learn Python, you need to learn. You need to learn R, you know. These are the things that's very important. You need to learn SAS too or SPSS. But things like R, Python, you know, uh, if you're working on Hadoop, Hi, these are the things that is so important for you guys to really know if you want to get into the big data field. And especially in this time and age where the open software is available, 
and you know you go to any university, R is being taught, Python is being taught, right? It is so crucial for all of you. Whether you're an industrial engineer, whether you're computer science or mathematics, that is the minimum tools that you need to learn as you start getting into the big data field. Okay? Did I answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Right. Any other questions on that? Yes. Um, is there any kind of law or is it big data? Um, what I'm trying to say is just data that is collected is just simply a lot, right? And where does it draw the line in between being legal or not? Is, is data collection legal? Yeah, well, uh, what, what is kind the of data? Yeah, basically, the da where does it, where is it not legal? Where does it start not being legal? I mean, they, they, it's a very good question. And the question is, and as I said in the beginning, the reason we collect data is not because of, it, 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 well, let me get back. I'll talk about Equifax in two minutes and tell you why data is important, okay? A credit bureau, Equifax is a credit bureau, and since you guys are still young, you don't know what a credit bureau is because you don't need one. A credit bureau, what, what it kind of does is that it collects a lot of information, okay? And let's say someone let's say in this wants to apply for credit, wants to apply for a loan. If I don't know about you, how I as a company can give you a loan? I can't. For instance, if I don't know your behavior, if do I, for instance, do you pay your money back on time? Do you, how much loan do you have? All that stuff. So what happens is that's the information we gather to make, to make sure that you as a consumer get the right rate, the credit, the loan, okay? So, you know, so when we say what is legal, it's basically, the, you know, it's we're trying to help the economy grow using credit, okay? So now what happens is that now, if I start using information that is not legal, like for instance, there's, you know, race, or things like that, that's not legal, you can't do that. That's where there is like a, you know, regulations, you can't do this to say, you know, if you're six feet, I can give you a loan, but you're five feet, you can't, I mean, you can't do those things. There are certain regulations to do that, okay? Financial industry is highly regulated, and you know, and the regulators make sure that none of us as an industry misuse it on purpose or by mistake, okay? So that's what we mean. So there are, you know, limits of what we can do with the data. I can't go and say, you know, what's your name? Alberto. You said something on the Facebook. Oh, that's the reason I can't give you a loan. That's not possible, I can't do that. Right? So that's the way. So there is a limit of what we can do with the data. And there's regulations everywhere. And it's always, you know, the industry or the market much, goes much faster in the use of the data. And the regulators catch up to that to make sure we are doing the right thing. But there's somewhere stipulated what you could collect and what you cannot collect from customers. There is stipulated what you can use and what you can't use. Okay? In, in, in credit decisions. But sometimes for marketing, it's a lot less. So, but still, you know, you can't do anything illegal about it, but I think there's a lot less restrictions. Okay? Let me try this again. Okay. I, I just want you guys to understand, you know, you know, based on that example I gave you of KBR, our whole life, is mediated through these devices. You know, if I don't have a device, for my, you know, as a matter of fact, I get my device in the car, I feel a little nervous. I mean, what's wrong with me? You know, your whole life is mediated by devices. So devices are always there, it's body for life. Okay. And I, what I spoke to you about is big data is crucial for business survival. You know, I have spoken about for the last 10 minutes on that. Okay. The second thing is, how many of you are economists? Any economists here? One or so. No? You must have heard of behavioral economics. Are you familiar with behavioral economics? In behavioral economics, what happens is we all, you know, most of the economics, we all think 
we are all rational human beings. But in the last 15 years, there's a field that shows that we are not rational, and it's called behavioral economics. So what happens is, is that how do you take the irrationality out? And big data helps us do that. Okay. And, and obviously, it makes sense of complex situation. But I just want to tell you something. It's, big data is not everything. It can't solve every problem. And I just put two things there. Social cognition. I can tell you that you have 400 friends on Facebook, and you may have 250. Doesn't mean you're more, it, it, you know, um, more friendly. What it means, it, what, what we can't find is I may spend two days somewhere with a friend of mine who is, who is a childhood friend for two days. It is much more powerful than spending a minute or two every day putting posts on Facebook. So you can't get that gravitas of the social relationship. So you've got to be careful. It means big data doesn't solve every problem. But social cognition is an issue that you've got to keep in mind. People say, oh, I, I know your sentiment. I can do these things. But it is a limitation. And the same, second thing is also the context, right? You know, for instance, I must have gone and um, had a bad payment of my credit card. And, you know, someone else. I did it because I'm a bad guy. Someone did it because of some unforeseen you know, issue, maybe ran into some kind of a problem or whatever. You don't get the context of the state. So you've got to be very careful. Big data doesn't solve every problem, but it solves a lot of problems. Okay? So let me tell you now. Equifax and big data. Okay. This is this is something that for the last we, we've been in big, big data for so long. Even before big data was big data, we had to invent technologies within Equifax. Within Equifax to handle the kind of data that we get. We get data from fifty thousand institutions every day, every month, every week. You gotta you have to get, get that data. So Equifax and big data is, is, is almost like synonymous. We invented big data to a large extent. And, and if you look at this, we have information on 600 million customers worldwide. 600 million. Their trade history. We have information on 80 million businesses. Mind you, these get updated on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We have information on 200 million people employee accounts. We know, we know their income, salary. Trade, you know what a trade is? Trade is basically every time I have a credit card transaction or things like that, you know, there's a trade when, you know, a monthly trade account comes in. It's a trade on a customer. You know, public records. People who went, you know, and maybe had problems outside, court issues. So we have information on all these people. So how do we take this information and help the businesses, help the consumers? What we try to do is we try to create a 360 degree view of a customer. To a large extent, you know, we have a balance sheet, an income statement on every individual, and we try to help them get credit. We do a lot more than that too, but just to give an idea, that's what we do. Any question on Equifax? And, and this data, this is what we do. If we want to get into the details, we have created a huge big data infrastructure. How many of you know Hadoop? Have you heard of Hadoop? One, two, three, okay, a couple. It is a huge Hadoop infrastructure. Two petabytes of data. It's, it is, if somebody says how big it is, it is bigger than big. It's huge. You know, this is when I say it's big data. What we're trying to do is we're getting all this trusted data that we have, data from all banks, from utilities, from all these companies. We get the data. Mind you, it's all consumer consent. We can't do without your permission. 
I have to have your permission to do these things. Okay? That's, you gotta keep that in mind. You just don't go and say, let me go get this guy's account somewhere and do something. No, it's all consumer consent. Okay? So, how did this happen? <laughs> We have some fun um, Thank you. I'm not going to touch this. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is so this huge Hadoop infrastructure, and and for those of you in computer science, we have written routines in Python in R, and even using SAS HPA, everything parallelized to go access this humongous two petabytes of data. And there is a huge center in Atlanta where I come from, where there are 200 data scientists going on with this data, full time. And what we're doing now is that we're bringing that kind of uh, technology to Central America, to Latin America, and that's that's what the plan is as a global organization. Okay, this is where you'll start honing on skills like, as I said, how do you use R and SAS together? How do you use Python? How do you use Hive? I mean, these are the kind of tools. So make sure when you start, you know, taking courses, it has these kind of things, which is very crucial for your success if you want to get into the big data field. I'm not saying the old traditional statistics is not important. You've got to be know that too. Things like majestic regression or, 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 or simple regression, clustering algorithms. Those are all important, but you better know how to use these tools. If not, it will be difficult to get a job in this area. So this is, I think I've spoken about this many times, what we do at Ecofab. You can see we assess loan risk. Make sure we can give you a loan, what's your risk, and we may assess loan risk. The other thing we're trying to do is fraud. Not we do fraud, identify fraud. Okay? And you know what happens is people, when they apply, they come and say, you know, even though, for instance, I, I say I'm Gabriel Diaz, and try to go and open an account and get some money out of it. But we have so much information. We can tell the bank, we can tell the financial institution, that you know, I'm not Gabriel Diaz, I'm someone else. And that's a huge fraud, it's a huge, huge uh, impact on the economy. And finally, we do a lot of marketing stuff too, you know. How do we help? For instance, once you have your loan, once you have your mortgage, well, can the company, the bank that you take the mortgage, can they help you with more stuff? Can you give them, you know, there's a lot of different marketing services the banks can do, and we help them do that, okay? So I've spoken for about 40 minutes. I just want to spend some time here to make sure the, the people in my team, the background of the people that I've hired. So if you have an idea, the kind of people that I've real hired and are working in this big data field. Okay? So we have people from computer science, most of you from there. The people from statistics, math, you know, a lot of math. What we're trying to do is that we're really coming up with uh, different algorithms to go test a few things. I mean, it's every one of these things, we have hired people from there. More than 200 in the US, 500 globally. These are the kind of people that we're looking for, and it is an incredible thing. You know, the data, and you can play with real stuff. I mean, it's it absolutely, you, you look at data and you create stuff, you create solutions. You know, it's forget about finance. You know, you go to San Francisco, your parking, you know, is based on big data. They can tell you exactly where the parking spot is available. It feels like, you know, areas that we never thought of, you use big data. I can go on and on with that. It is a beautiful thing. Any questions on this? I mean, this is the last slide. I'm open for any Q&A for the next 15, 20 minutes. Please. Uh, hi. Um, well, I just want to ask you, uh, uh, how do you enterprise um, tell about 
the good information um, versus all the garbage that we, the the business the sorry um, the enterprise uh, take from uh, from everybody from from the different business uh, how the Equifax get the good information and and take uh, take a uh, um, discard uh, the garbage, all the information that is not useful for the enterprise. Uh, let me phrase the question. How are we trying to see which data is useful, which data is not? Exactly. Okay, okay. So one of the things that, is a very good question. One of the things that we have, the data that we get from our financial institutions to do what is called credit decision. That data is pretty accurate, pretty clean. And we use that data really well, but we check to see if there's some errors here or there. But the place where we need a lot of data scientists to come and look at it is in the unstructured data. A lot of things come in. 95% of the data is useless. You know, what do I need to know where you're sitting every day? You know what I mean? It's, it's, I get all this information. How do you clean that up? And that is where the data scientists are spending time is how do you create good, valid information from the unstructured database? That's what we do. But on the structured side, most of it is helpful. Very rare. 99% of it is useful. Maybe 1 or 2% may be wrong. But in the unstructured space, it's the other way around. Most of it is like noise. You don't know what's happening. You try to go and extract the most important. Um, I, I would like to know more about the business model of big data, how you create a, a business with using big data, and especially how you do outsourcing or how did you sell or sourcing uh, big data as a service? Big data as a service. Well, this big data, I'll tell you, it's, it's I've given two different answers on the business model. What many companies are doing, especially the startup companies, right? That's what I think I'm sure you want, you're more curious on. You know, can you become the next Bill Gates, or Steve Jobs, or, you know, right? They are looking at it slightly different, not in terms of can I generate revenue right away today. They look at something like can I get usage out of it? Then we we'll we'll figure a way out to make money out of it. Can I have a million people or a billion people start using my services? based on data. Then I'll figure a way to make money out of it. You know, same thing happened in Facebook, same thing happening in Twitter. They're trying to figure out, get the usage up, and then you know you, you, you create a business model on it. In huge companies, what is happening is that they're using data for three things. One is efficiency. There's a lot of inefficient process happening. Can I use data to clean up that? And number two, is all this question of can I have the right offers, like marketing offers, sales offers, and all that. And number three, it's, it's moving away from what is called hunches and intuition of making decision into right actual data with the data sets. Okay? So, but in terms of outsourcing or offshoring or outsourcing big data, it depends. One of the things that's happening is that at least in my company, we sort of outsource things that is a commodity that needs to be done, we outsource it. But if it's an IP, we want to have an intellectual property, we keep it in-house. So it's good for us. Okay? Coming back to the question, there are three things that is important for big data. One thing obviously is the data. You have to know the data pretty well. The data has to be clean, it should be perfect. The second thing is analytics. You have to know what you can do with the data. Adding value to data is analytics. And the third thing that is not much spoken about is linking. So when I get information on Gabriel from 100 different locations, 
I need to know it's the same Gabriel. How do I link it together? So the data, analytics, and linking, those are the three crucial aspects for big data. Okay, business model, you can have what is called usage model, get the usage, then figure a way out and monetize it. And the big companies, they're already monetizing it for things like, we at Equifax, we are one of the few companies who really know how to monetize data. If you look at all the other companies, nothing against them, but data is to them is an intangible asset. You go work for, and I work for HP. You work for, and you know, I work for Dreyfus, and all these companies. You use data as an intangible asset to help something. At Equifax, data is a tangible asset. We make money on data. You know, it's, 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 that's the reason I, you know, if somebody says, why did you join Equifax? It's because data is a tangible asset. If I could put that on a balance sheet, I would love to put that on a balance sheet. That's the beauty of it. Okay? Any other? Did that's your question? Yes, that, that sounds great. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, could you, I have two questions. One has to do with data visualization. How much are you using data visualization? Visualization. And then um, about machine learning or deep learning, how much are you using it into that Equifax? Data visualization, again, is another skill that you guys should have. It's very important. Okay. You can have all this data inside your warehouse and all that stuff. Only geeks like you and me can understand that. <laughs> and we get so excited and say, oh, look at the KS. It's 56. Oh my God. And no one cares outside. You know? <laughs> it's like us. And we get so excited about KS, you know, the two KS points here is better. Visualization is important. And to do that, the entire info, you know, the database that we created, we have people and the tools and people trying to visualize data. And the kind of tools and skills they're using, a simple thing like Spotfire and Business Object, but they're using D3 to dance. The data make the data dance. So for instance, what we're doing, honestly, we're creating an app store. Every data that we have, you know, it's so difficult to send an Excel sheet, send stuff to everybody. What are we trying to do? We're creating an app store. And the app store is nothing but visualization. You click on that, you get the information. For instance, I can click and say, how many people moved from Georgia to California? OK, what can I do with that data? So that's it. Visualization is very crucial for success of the data. Thank you for the question. And in terms of machine learning, Remember, we're talking about all the, the, the two, two things in machine learning. One is, one of the most popular things that we, learn, we use in machine learning is random forest. Keep doing that, we use that a lot. But the way, way we use machine learning a lot is in this, you know, what is called self-learning process. So what I say is, let's say I give you some kind of an offer, as an example, marketing offer. You don't like it, I learn it. The, you know, so this, the whole self-learning process, we have machine learning to do that. Okay? So machine learning is very important for us. That's going to help us really figure out what kind of data. Here's an example. One of the biggest things that we do with all this data that we have, we create what is called attributes. Attributes on a customer. What we do now is what we used to do before is attributes is based on certain hypothesis. If this, 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 then we have an attribute this. But what we're doing now is we're asking machine learning to create the attributes based on certain inputs. You know, so machine learning is a very big deal. We're going you know, to be using that. That's another skill set that I would really consider you guys to learn that. The other one that's very important is that blockchain. I don't know how many, are you familiar with blockchain? No? One. You know, are you familiar with something called, something called Bitcoin? No? Yeah, yeah. So it's based on something called blockchain. That's something you need to understand because I feel in 10 years from now, it's going to be you know, totally different. The business of ID is going to be based on blockchain. So learn that. See what you can do on the blockchain stuff. If there's a thesis you've got to work on, work on that blockchain. Be a good way to do it. Any other question? Yes, sir. I am concerned that in 
Yes, Bacon. Yeah. In markets which are not highly regulated, like the one we have here, what about denial of medical insurance based on your history? Or when you are stuck with your previous past and you're trying to move on? I think, I think you follow my question because there has been also a few comments on that in the US. So what, what's your What's your take on that? How do you see those things? It's your question. I want to can the data on especially like medical and misuse for things that is um, maybe not misuse, but uh, for example, you go a lot to the doctor, so mm -hmm. the insurance company will say, "But well, you are a candidate for a higher premium." That is to your disadvantage. That's the reason. I mean. I wish I had a simple answer for that. But the thing is that, again, I was talking about the whole idea of what's the responsibility of the corporations, what's the responsibility of the regulators, how do we use the data. It's, it's like we had this huge, humongous, um, what I call, find of big data. How do we govern ourselves? How do we do that? It's, it's a topic that you, you need panels to discuss. It, you know, I'm totally understanding. It's like you go in and say, this guy's. Maybe we need to you know, increase his um, health insurance. Same thing happening in the auto side, for instance. You know, people are putting you know, those kind of devices and says, okay, this guy's you know, driving fast. Maybe we should increase his insurance. These things are happening. So we have to figure a way out how do we govern ourselves? How do we mis don't receive the data? It's a tough question. Thank you. Okay, um, based on the last slide, I would like to know how you, how, can you describe a typical uh, team? Because I'm, I'm a computer science student and I, I like coding, I like R, I like Python, but uh, if, if I want to be a big data specialist, I, I suppose that I would have to work with people who are not computer science uh, or programmers. So I would like to, if, if you can describe a typical team um, that works okay. in the area. There are basically, I, know I showed you all the slides for the kind of people who are working. The kind of teams that you have is, you have teams who are working on you know, the people who look at the data and create models of it. Okay. To get access to the data, you need somebody who knows high. Okay. So the statistician will be working with the computer science who knows high. And the statistician would know R and R and SAS. Then once that happens, it has to be visualized. To do the visualization, somebody who knows business objects is a simple thing, but D3, all these special visualization program, that, so it's, it's a very, what I call, we have teams working together who are statisticians, computer science, you know, and BI kind of people, okay? And, and also to them, there are also people who are traditional MBAs who are strategists, trying to say, what can we do with the data, you know? two years from now, five years from now, because there are projects people are working on, which is not just two years old, but also five years from now. You know, what happens if you know, blockchain takes over? What happens to Equifax? So you have all these people working together, and what happens in certain projects, you bring these people together to work on the project. It's not like you are only, you know, you, you are in this department, no. You have groups that come in, work together, and then you, come, you separate and work. That's what happens. Okay? So it's different, different skill set, but one of the things you need to do is you have to be a master of one or two skills and have a general knowledge of other stuff. This way, you can be a good data scientist. Okay? Anything else? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for hospitality. I enjoyed. I hope you guys also enjoyed. And, you know, I, it might be any time I'll be back. <laughs>